All right, welcome back. We are back from our closed session. I'd like to turn it over to our new student member, Nguyen. This meeting of the Sacramento City School Board is being recorded in its entirety and will be cablecast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse. Today's meeting will air Sunday, September 10th at 9 p.m., Monday, September 11th at 9 a.m., and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. We welcome members of the audience to address the board. Please fill out a speaker form located in the back of the community room and give them to our communications representative prior to the conclusion of the item's presentation. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Please limit comments during public comment to items that are not on the agenda. If you do comment on an item that is on the agenda, we will ask that you please defer your comments until your item comes up on the agenda. Please also turn off your cell phones or place them on silent or vibrate. Thank you. Thank you. Is Devosha Madkins, has she joined us yet? We may have a second duty for our new student member to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Devosha Adkins. All right. We knew she might be a little late, um, but we can recognize her when she shows up. But we will ask you to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'd like to stand up and join us up here. Oh, did we use that song? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, a nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. Uh, Mr. Barons? I do not have an announcement uh, out of closed session, but the superintendent does. Thank you and good evening. I am pleased to announce that the board, by unanimous vote, approved the appointment of Mr. Garrett Kirkland as Principal Hiram Johnson High School. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion for an agenda adoption? So moved. Second. I'll move and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you very much. And then we'll move to our special presentation. So glad we're joined by so many friends today. So welcome. September marks the beginning of school, beginning of the fall harvest, and Sacramento's annual Farm to Fort Festival. The Sacramento City Board wants to build on that excitement by declaring September 2017 as Food Literacy Month. Food literacy is defined as the understanding of the impact of our food choices on personal and public health, the environment, and our community. The objective of Food Literacy Month is to promote food education, inspire good choices, uh, inspire parental involvement, and motivate community-wide support. Tonight, the board would like to highlight some of our very key partners in this work. And I've had the privilege of working with many of them myself, uh, and Sacramento is lucky to have all of you participating with us, and we really appreciate it. So we have some certificates. What I'll do is I'll uh, read a little bit uh, about each of the programs, and then I'll ask you all to come up, and we'll um, have board members come down if they'd like and join for some pictures and recognition. First, let me start with Israeli Family Urban Farm. Kanuk and Judith Israel highlight the importance for food literacy efforts to ex extend beyond the normal school day and year. Uh, Israel's Project Good is a summertime program, almost 50 hours, that offers a complete wraparound education for students ages 11 to 19. The summer program walks students through everything from planting, growing, harvesting, preparation, cooking, and compost. So we really appreciate your work on that. So thank you very much. Our very own Burbank Urban Garden, also known as BUG, 
is something else that we're very proud of. It began as an after-school program a couple of years ago, but just became the district's newest link learning pathway this year due to a number of promising factors, such as the overwhelming student interest among the interests of many others. We are proud to have an urban agricultural pathway in our district and excited to watch the program grow. So thank you very much, Debug. Soilborn Farms is another one of our partners, and it may be one of the longest known urban agricultural nonprofits in our area. Shannon Hardwick is currently working closely with our staff to develop district wide garden curriculum aligned with the next generation science standards. She also works to develop the capacity of garden educators through their annual garden symposium held at Luther Burbank High School every March. Last year, more than 750 garden educators attended the event. They also partner with numerous schools throughout the district to educate st students uh, through biweekly garden-based classes. Uh, another very honored partner. Thank you very much to Soilborn Farms. Another one of our high flyers in our own district is the Culinary Academy at Rosemont High School. And I can attest to that of having uh, tasted their food on several occasions. And I'll look forward to having some more, I think, right at the Farm to Fork Festival in a couple weeks. Um, the Culinary Academy at Rosemont prepares students for college and the workplace through the study of culinary arts, environmental science, and urban agriculture. Scott Singer views food and agriculture as a lens for which students can learn about environmental and social, social justice. Students come to realize that they are both consumers and producers through the study of food and culture. The pathways that they work on are able to oftentimes earn their first job on campus in the cafeteria and to build skills and resumes that can take them to college and careers. So we're very proud of the work that's done at Rosemont. So thank you very much for that and congratulations to the Culinary Academy. And finally, the Food Literacy Center. So I've had a chance to work with them personally uh, as well and just are really proud of the work that they've done at many of our schools, working with a lot of our low-income students and teaching the students and the families the importance of healthy eating, how to eat vegetables, to explore and try new things and really stretch yourself. Uh, they have motivated an amazing group of volunteers. Uh, they have a really dedicated group of folks that are on their board and work hard and help raise money to keep the program going and have a lot of respect in the culinary community amongst the restaurant community and our chefs. And I think it's just another great testament to the kinds of things that Sacramento can produce and uh, why we're so proud to have the Food Literacy Center as one of our partners. So congratulations to you as well. And maybe I can call up Amber Stott and your folks, and Scott Singer, uh, I don't know if Todd is here from Bug, Shannon Hardwick, Canuck, and Judith, and we will do, uh, we have a presentation of some resolutions that we'd like to give you, and if any of the board members would like to come down. Come on down. <laughs> We'll take them in front here. Yeah. Come on in here. Oh, 
The what? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again to all of our wonderful partners, uh, and we'll look forward to some farm to fork stuff coming up in a couple weeks. Um, we move to 8.0 public comment. Mr. Barrios. We have five public comments. Um, first up is Mike Brunell, followed by Thomas George and Annette Good evening. My name is Mike Brunell. I represent the NorCal Trade and Technical School, which is a uh, adult serving charter school that we hope to open in the south area of Sacramento. I'm here tonight to confirm our submittal of our uh, letter of petition intent and the petitioner assurance and disclosures that you should have copies of. And also to state our intention to deliver the required quantity of petitions and appendices on September 29th, 2017, between eight and noon in the superintendent's office. Um, I think that was pretty much all we had to say. You're welcome. <laughs> at this point. Thanks for joining us, Questions. Mike, and uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Thomas George. Welcome. Hi, my name is Thomas George. My name is Thomas George. I go to West Campus High School. I'm a sophomore and uh, I'm part of our engineering program and I participate in robotics and uh, the CREATE program after school. Uh, in addition, I ride my bike uh, downtown to the Hacker Lab um, and uh, it would be great if my school had better lab space. Uh, this is a picture of my school's engineering lab. Um, I'd appreciate it if we had better lab space. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It looks like it needs to be re-engineered, so maybe we can work something out on that. Have you met your, your board member, Michael Manick? You guys can share share cards. Or... Yeah, here I'll I'll, I'll bring you uh, contact information. We can we can chat. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you coming down. Did you ride your bike here? Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> Ann Hartridge, followed by Alex Alexander and Darlene Anderson.
Hi, my name is Ann Hartridge, and I'm a relative of Thomas George. I'm really excited to talk about the engineering program at West Campus. Um, it's just me tonight, because uh, the school year has just started, but we had a preliminary meeting on Tuesday night, and the parents group are super excited to, uh, to develop this engineering program at West. Um, it's a four-year program. They have students taking classes and also doing after-school activities. Um, and the engineering teacher says that he's got, um, he starts out with, uh, with a really high representation of girls in his freshman classes. By the time it drops to senior year, uh, that percentage drops significantly. Um, as you probably know, West Campus has a high percentage of students who qualify for free and reduced lunches. The engineering teacher right now has got a, um, uh, he's got four mentors on board from the private sector who have volunteered to come in and help kids after school uh, compete uh, to put together a uh, proposal for the rail yards downtown. And uh, we're really hoping that um, they will uh, not only have better lab facilities to work with, because um, as you saw in the photo, it was a table with boxes on it, um, but that they will have uh, some support from the board uh, generally. And oh. I want to let you know that we're looking forward to um, uh, hearing from the district uh, next Thursday at back to school night um, about plans for uh, starting construction. Uh, I know when my son was an eighth grader, we heard that construction uh, would begin this last summer. Um, so we're really excited to have that construction starting uh, whenever it's going to start, hopefully any day. Um, and I just wanted to thank you uh, for your support of the West Campus Engineering Program. Thank you very much. Esther Rios, followed by Darlene Anderson. Everybody here. This may not be the proper forum to, to discuss this, but this is an issue that is affecting my daughter right now, and I've been dealing with this for the last three years. Mr. Barrios, I think you might remember my name. Anyhow, um, my daughter attends McClatchy High School. This is the only school in Sacramento that the principal, Lambert, has taken away the rights of the counselors to allow the students to transfer to another class when they feel they're failing. So in September of 2016, my daughter was not passing her Spanish class. That right away, she quickly knew she needed to switch classes. She was at, told that she had to go to a, speak to a vice principal who was busy. This was five ping pongs that they ping ponged her around. She could not get her classes removed. She's now starting to fail. This kid comes from Sutter Middle School. Mr. Rodriguez was her principal, where she was in gate. She came into McClatchy as an AP student, and her grades have substantially fallen. Now they are trying to ask her. She's in the fourth year in her police academy, this is a criminal justice class, her fourth year in the honor guard, her fourth year in the uh, quiz bowl, and now she's commander. I have to take her over to the, she's also a water boy for the football team. And they are now asking her to leave. At, this is all at the hands of the principal who has a son who attends the school and who's monopolized the counselors. We had a very good counselor, and one of the best counselors at McClatchy named Mr. Clock, who retired. He retired as a result of this very issue. I know this by personal, and I hope that he doesn't get mad at me for sharing this with you, but anyhow, he did retire, and I really need this board to, I tried at every level to address the issue with the school, with the district, with Janet Petullo, with Mary Hardin Young. I've done, exhausted every effort that I possibly can, and the counselors still have not be, been given their right, and this is the only school, let me repeat, in Sacramento that has done this. And my daughter is, it's not okay. Is this, we, I need your attention now. Well, thank you. I'm going to ask that Nathaniel Browning uh, meet with you right now. And then I know he's been working on this issue and will work to get it resolved. I appreciate that. Thank you all for your time. Yep. Thank you for coming. Good evening, Darlene Anderson. 
I had recently requested some information. I was trying to figure out just where our students were, students of Asiatic or African American, or however you want to look at it, that where they were. Because I find that most of the time, students are below in grade level. And when they're below grade level, they usually don't get credits. And uh, I've worked with several students who are credit deficient in the 12th grade, some 200 credit deficient. And I was just trying to figure out how many students were they. So I got this back from the district. And I guess uh, I should read what I asked. How many students were transferred to the Excel Accelerated Academy? How many 10th grade students entered into the Accelerated Academy this year, basically? I was just trying to figure out where the kids are because you can't find them separately anymore. You can't go on the CD's website and see how many African-American students are totally enrolled in the district. And I was just trying to figure out what I got back because there's no, there was no key to read it. So I'm assuming, I assumed that there were at least 11,000 kids that were African-American in the district. So there would be at least like 3,000 that would be seniors. But how many of those seniors are at grade level? And you can't really address an issue if you don't know where you are. And so it's very critical that we understand that in the ninth grade, if the kids don't get credits, well, they're credit deficient. In the 10th grade, if they don't get credits, they're still credit deficient. But when the district is running its own credit recovery program, well, that just doesn't make sense to me. How can you run a dropout program when you're supposed to be educating the kids? And that's what this district has done. It's the only district in the state of California that has their own credit recovery program. And so we used to have it where you do side by side in the school and make up credits during the year. Now we have our own. So kids disenroll basically and enroll in that. And I just want to know where the students are. I, this is not really clear. And I'm going to try and reword it so I get a better understanding. But that has no key. And if you've seen it before, hopefully you understand it because I don't. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. No further public comments? Any more public comments? Okay. Um, first, I'd like to turn it over to our superintendent who has a statement to read. Thank you, President Hansen. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to make a statement about um, DACA. Our district is extremely disappointed by the president's decision to repeal a promise made to over 800,000 innocent hardworking Americans brought to this country as young children by their parents. The president's action this week reneges on this country's commitment to provide these young Americans an equal opportunity to pursue and achieve the American dream. We believe this decision is extremely short-sighted and ignores the valuable contributions of dreamers to our society. It will not only serve as a devastating blow to the lives and communities of dreamers and their families, 200,000 of whom reside in California. It will also negatively impact their employers, our economy, and our country if a long-term solution is not adopted by Congress and implemented quickly. Sacramento City Unified understands the harmful implications of this decision and will advocate for legislation to protect dreamers. In our district, we know there are a number of dreamer students, as well as teachers and employees, they are valuable members of our community and the SCUSD family. We will not abandon them. Instead, we will join a bipartisan coalition of educators, business, and civil rights leaders across the United States to work on a law to protect these valuable members of our community. Our district was among the first in California to declare itself a safe haven school district. In Sac City Unified, we welcome all students and employees, and we will continue to uphold our commitment so that promise so that promise by protecting, advocating, and ensuring that all members of the SCUSD family feel safe and welcome in our schools. Thank you very much. Um, and and our... Uh, it's certainly a reflection of the board as well, and I know board members are going to be making their own uh, statements during our board uh, sharing information. So thank you again for that, Superintendent. Um, I want to introduce the next item that we're going to be discussing with uh, some brief remarks as well.
we had our opening uh, school press conference last week, and we faced up to the fact that we'd had some bad news, really, in our district the last couple of years, and that was uh, that while the state's graduation rates and local school district graduation rates were up, ours were down. And, you know, we're lagging behind uh, our neighboring districts, you know, particularly Elk Grove and Natomas, which both have managed uh, graduation rates over 90 percent. So that's where we need to be aiming for that and higher to make sure we're not leaving our students behind. Um, it's important for us to be honest about where we're at so we can make the changes that we need to internally to address that problem and to be accountable to the folks that have elected us and put us up here on this dais. And we're going to be working incredibly hard with the board, with our superintendent, with all of our staff to reverse this trend and to make sure that um, we deliver uh, what I think our students and our families rightfully expect from us. And that's making sure that we're putting forward our best efforts and we're accomplishing what we need to do to make sure our students are graduating at higher levels. Um, I believe, and our board believes, we took a big first step this summer when we hired our new superintendent, Jorge Aguilar. And I know he's been working extraordinarily hard with our wonderful staff here at CERNA and in our schools uh, to start working to identify what are the things that we need to do to reverse this trend and to address the problems. And there's a lot of things that we can figure out you know, by looking at the data and diving in deeper. Um, there's a lot of work that's going to have to be done there, and it's going to be a lot of system change. It's going to be a lot of change by our staff is going to have to do things in different ways. But I think we would all are going to recognize that it's valuable and it's the right thing to do. And when we see results, it's going to make it all the more easy uh, to accomplish those things. So every month, uh, starting this month, we're going to uh, increase our accountability as a board. And we're going to have items that are going to directly address student achievement. Um, and I'm doing this to kind of introduce our next uh, topic on the agenda. Um, we want to make sure that we're having uh, conversations about student achievement at each of our board meetings so we can help focus ourselves and help focus our staff and our community on making the changes that we need to to move this our needle in the right direction on graduation rate. So that being said, well, let me move to item 9.1 and invite up uh, Iris and Vincent to please join us. Welcome. Good evening, Board President Hanson, fellow board members, and Superintendent Aguilar. Uh, my name again is Vincent Harris. I've joined the district in our continuous improvement and accountability office, and I am excited to be here uh, and look forward to working with all of you in the community and on all the staff. Um, tonight, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, have an opportunity to share with you uh, some of our recent trends and graduation uh, rates with uh, Dr. Iris Taylor, our Chief Academic Officer. And so we'll uh, begin in haste with the uh, presentation. There you go. First step in anything, is it on? All right. So in terms of tonight's presentation, uh, working with the superintendent, we framed it around a few strategic elements. And so uh, ultimately, as we think about tonight's presentation, we're going to talk a bit about the foundation of our work, which is going to be around the equity and access guiding principle. Then we'll talk more deeply about graduation. Why does it matter? Why are we choosing this topic? And then we'll dive more deeply uh, into our current reality here in Sacramento City uh, Unified in which we'll look at a various data sets really with the intent of studying, um, as the superintendent has mentioned in his talk about uh, how we are going to apply the equity and access to social justice guiding principle. A lot of the first stage of that work involves trying to see the system and, and looking at the data. And then we'll actually apply through a, a, a equity access to social justice filter um, a look at some of the things that are emerging within our, our first review of things within Sacramento City Unified. Uh, to give you a front load, if you will, about some of the work that will be emerging over the school year. So the guiding principle, uh, I know many of you, or hopefully everyone, will become very familiar with over time. 
really is the foundation of our work. As we think about the guiding principle, graduation itself is called out as kind of the, the foundation of it. So this whole notion of equal opportunity to graduate. And so as we think about tonight's presentation, it is really diving deep on that first part of the grinding principle. And then over the rest of our presentation during the school year, we'll talk more deeply about other things in terms of greatest number of post-secondary choices and, and of course, then the widest array of options. But in making the guiding principle come to life, we actually recognize that the, the district's core value is actually fundamental. Um, as we think about the opportunity for our students, and as you'll see the data as it relates to whether we're looking at it through the filter of uh, subgroup data or we're looking at various uh, school site data, or even as we compare ourselves, as Board President Hansen spoke to other school districts, uh, you're going to see variation in, in the performance. And we recognize that actually ties to the core value of recognizing that as a system, um, there are longstanding inequities that we have to address. And so ultimately, a lot of our work will be studying those inequities so that we can learn um, how to address them going forward and, and of course, mitigate them. So as we think about the equity and access and social justice guiding principle, you know, it really breaks into three big chunks. And so those chunks, of course, are listed in front of you uh, on the screens. But, but if we were to summarize those chunks in kind of three big terms, the, the first chunk is seeing the system. And so that's the whole notion of the real-time data. The, the real-time data is, is so fundamental in terms of, of looking at issues of equity, access, and social justice because it allows you to see what is happening. And then you transition to a conversation around the notion of, of studying the system, really understanding why does the system perform in the way which it does. And so studying um, becomes fundamental in our work going forward as we look to address um, longstanding inequities that we see in, through the data. And then finally, uh, there's an element of taking action, which is the notion of as we look at inequities that we want to close gaps or look at inequities that we want to fully resolve, there's this notion of improvement. Um, and so we'll talk to you. Uh, not so much, of course, tonight because we're, we're doing the context setting, but as we get further into our work, uh, we'll be able to share with you some of the work that will be underway in order to improve and close inequities um, that we see in the system. Why graduation? And, and certainly this is going to be redundant. Many folks, depending on how you do your research, uh, are all aware of, of the promise that graduation brings for our students. Um, here we have a summary of some of the research that America's uh, promise has done. And, and fundamentally, the research breaks into two big, broad categories. One big advantage of graduation is certainly economic. We know that it opens up uh, career opportunities for students. And then there's the life chance piece, which, which isn't necessarily as equally tangible, but certainly in some degrees is measurable as it relates to this notion of, of better health, life expectancy, and, and better engagement uh, as a citizen, if you will, in, in society. And so we know that graduation has many benefits to it, and that's why we, we see it as important to talk about. And then ultimately, as we build our studying capacity, we've been doing research and we're starting our research journey. Uh, one uh, exemplar from that research uh, is Russell Rumberger's book on dropping out. And so as we think about the context of graduation, recognizing um, that mitigating dropouts is, is one of the most fundamental steps in increasing graduation rate. Um, and certainly as, as Russell Rumberger's research shows us with a million uh, dropouts per year, we, we know that there's a real call to action about how do we address that. And so we're starting our own uh, colleagueship of expertise, if you will, really trying to understand what do experts say about uh, dropping out and, and best practices to get more students to graduate. And then this slide just basically, again, summarizes kind of the current reality as we think about this, the high stakes nature of having our students have the greatest opportunity to be successful, really means ensuring that as they come into uh, society as employees, as future workers, that we get them into the best position to do their best work. And, and of course, obviously, there's many ways in which folks uh, contribute to our society. Uh, this just highlights, you know, one way in which, as we think about life chances for our students, having more students graduate actually puts them in a better position uh, to provide for their families and themselves going forward. So with that, I'm going to transition the presentation to Dr. Taylor. So good evening, Board President Hansen, members of the board, and Superintendent Aguilar. The research Mr. Harris has shared um, regarding the high school, the impact of high school graduation on things like health, well-being, earnings, um, and just out life outcomes is profound. And as we work in service of our students and families to positively impact their lives beyond their time with us, there are certain commitments that we've made 
These commitments are outlined here on this slide. First, we recognize the critical role that teachers play in educating our students. And we will collaborate with our teachers and support them to provide high quality instruction in classrooms every day. Um, secondly, we, 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 we will create a data-driven culture, but one where data is treated with the ultimate respect. And by that, we mean that we recognize that our students are not just numbers, but that behind every number is a child, and that child has a need, and that child has a name. And although we have high aspirations, absolutely, we will place greater attention and focus on the outcomes that we're actually producing. And tonight's presentation of data is our beginning um, of, of doing just that. We recognize that many of our students face, face challenges that to some may seem inter, insurmountable. And we recognize this, but we won't allow those um, to be those external forces to limit what we do with our students. We instead will see these as, as sources of strength, as um, not as limiting factors, but as assets that we can draw on in order to help them reach their dreams. And finally, we will not wait, nor will we spend time sitting around bemoaning the fact that we could have done or should have done, but instead we'll seek to change conditions for our students in the present. Okay. So let's first take a look at our data. And I want to start by just, again, sharing this headline that is now familiar to all of us. And I'll just say frankly that seeing headlines like this, is, it's difficult. Um, yet the question that is posed here, why aren't kids graduating in Sac City, is the right question to be asked. Um, to begin to answer this question, however, we must first look at our data. And as I share the next few slides that outline our data, I'm going to call your attention to the variation that um, Mr. Harris mentioned earlier, the variation in performance that's outlined in the data. Because it's only through understanding that variation that we can begin to see how, what is it that we need to do to address it. So here we show Sac City's graduation rates from the 2015-16 school year. And this is the most recent data that's available to, in, by the state. We see that the graduation, the district's graduation rates are about 1% below the county, which is in yellow, and about 3% below the state, which is in green. When we look at Sac City's graduation rates over the past two years in comparison to surrounding districts, and this is what um, Board President Hansen was referring to earlier. So when we look at Sac City's performance in comparison to surrounding districts, we see that similarly, um, we see similar patterns. Although most of the districts ex experience slight increases, um, Sacramento still remains in, in the bottom half of, of the districts. So this slide shows two years of graduation data for our comprehensive high schools. And here you see almost all of these schools are at or above the district, district's average, with the exception um, being Hiram Johnson, and above the state average, with the exception being Burbank and Johnson. And if noticeably, there's a decline at Burbank, Rosemont, and C.K. McClatchy, which raises even further questions for us. This pattern holds true for our small high schools, which are all above the state and district average. However, all experienced a decline in the two-year period, which is reflected on this slide. The variation that, has been, had, that you've been seeing along with the previous slides becomes even more apparent in this snapshot of our alternative high schools, which we know serve our most vulnerable and some of our most disadvantaged students. So 
So here we did disaggregated our graduation data by race ethnicity, and we see that there's great variation in performance amongst our racial and ethnic groups. Gaps persist with our African American and Hispanic students who are graduating at six to eight percentage points lower than their white peers and about 13 to 20% lower than their Asian peers. And before I leave this slide though, I wanna note that um, we are in the process of disaggregating this Asian subgroup data. I know that has been requested by the board on several occasions. And so we're in the process of disaggregating it. We expect to have that data available for the first meeting of the, the task force on September 20th. Um, but just knowing that the, the ethnic groups within that, that category, that there's variation in there. And if we really want to understand how do we address the needs of students within that group, we have to disaggregate that data. This last slide of data shows our student performance within our programs. So by programs, I mean our special education, um, our students with disabilities, our English learners, our socioeconomic disadvantage. And again, the pattern holds deep variation between students within these um, programs compared to the district average and not here shown the state and the county average. So Mr. Harris, we thought it was important that you understand just how graduation rates were calculated. So Mr. Harris is gonna walk you through an activity for that. Dr. Taylor, um, and certainly as we think about graduation rate, there, there's always you know, a, a great debate about the best way to calculate it. Uh, currently within California, it is done through a, a relatively uh, straightforward cohort analysis in which you have a base year of students uh, and then over the course of those four years as they go from ninth graders to 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders, um, there's puts and takes. Students who unfortunately may drop out, students who may transfer to another district, um, and then students who uh, may you know, exit the state of California, what have you. What I'd like to do over the next just few minutes is just give you a sense of how graduation is calculated to try and make the definition come to life. And so that will be what we'll do on the next slide. So let's assume we start with a cohort of students of 100 students, so these are 100 ninth graders. Uh, we know that 22 of those students transfer out uh, between the grades nine through 12 in, from Sacramento City Unified School District. Now we don't know uh, the full story of the 22, but we know that 22 uh, have exited the district before graduating. That leaves us with 78 students who officially then graduate. Now, Thanks to the CalPAD system that the state of California has, we were able to identify that two of those students actually enrolled in another district. And so ultimately uh, that mitigates uh, the risk for those students. We know that they ended up at Natomas or Twin Rivers or some na other neighboring district. But that also means that for the 20 students where we have no evidence, um, they technically are our dropouts. Uh, as I mentioned, there's puts and takes. We also get two students who transfer in. So again, these students may come from uh, Los Angeles Unified, uh, San Francisco Unified, we have two students who come in at some point uh, between the grades nine through 12, and so they get added to our base. This then raises our base of graduates from 78, who are the students that we just spoke about who were, who were left over, plus the two additional students who joined our district. But it is important to reflect that we are uh, through this example showing that 20 students, we have no evidence. And so those students technically would then be categorized as dropouts. So just to summarize the calculation, we have 100, so we started with 22 transferred out. That left us with 78. We added back two who transferred in because they came in from another district. That leaves us with 80 net graduates. So that 80 reflects those students who graduated. And as we think about the denominator for this, of course, we have the 100 that we started with, the 22 transferred out, the 78, of course, the two who transferred in, and that leaves with 80 graduates. But then we also recognize we had 20 dropouts. Those are the students that we couldn't find. And so ultimately, that gets us back to what we expected was 100. We, we, we were down by the 20. And so ultimately, when you take the 80 divided by the 100, you end up with an 80% graduation rate. So. Hopefully this infographic was somewhat helpful in, in trying to talk through uh, graduation. It was our attempt to hopefully, uh, again, studying the system, 
we, we don't believe there should be anything that is mysterious. We believe everything hopefully can be, be understood. That gives us, that's the first step, frankly, in us being able to tackle longstanding problems. With that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Dr. Taylor. Thank you. So as you can see from the data and just the way that graduation is um, calculated within the state, there's a great deal of work that that needs to be done in order for us to change the data picture that you just saw. And so we bring this slide back to your attention, the slide of our core values, because it reminds us that the system that we're trying to do this in is inequitable by design. And in order to have other, a different outcome, then we need to change the system. We need to interrupt the inequities. One thing that we will need to do that to, in order to do that is to examine things like our policies, our procedures, our practices, and our traditions for the ways that they serve to perpetuate inequities. One such policy that the graduation task force but we'll take a look at, but here tonight we just want to, to give you a little precursor for that work. Um, so one such policy is our board graduation policy, 6146.1 which begins with the statement that's outlined on this slide. And I, I, as I read the statement, it's reflective of, of much of um, the research that Mr. Harris has shared in terms of our goal being to have students graduate from the district able to access an array of post-secondary choices from a wide array of options. This speaks specifically to graduation from high school. Here we outline the subject areas that are in the board policy. So the subject areas that students um, must, taste, must take coursework in. And then the center column is the number of years and credits that a student must earn to graduate from Sacramento City Unified. The last column are the A through G requirements or the, the CSU, the Cal State University, and the University of California requirements for entry into uh, um, those institutions. The yellow highlighting are just the areas where there's, there's quite a bit of variation from what the district's expectations are for graduation versus what the colleges and universities are requiring for, for entry. We'd like to take a closer look at this math requirement. So if you look at the Sacramento City Board policy around mathematics and the mathematics needed to graduate from Sacramento City Unified, you'll see that the district requires two years of math. And that's consistent. That's the minimum requirement by the state of California. The CSU and the UC system, however, require three but recommend four. Um, as we began to research, you know, what are the requirements of, of other districts, similar demographics or like districts to a certain extent that have higher graduation rates than us, what were their math requirements? And we can see here that Long Beach and Garden Grove both have a three-year math requirement. So this, this requirement requires just some peeling back. If we think about who are the students who are accessing the three years of math or the four years of math and who's not? What does it require in terms of understanding of the system and ability to navigate the system in order for, for you to um, attain the three and four years that are required? Our next steps. As we mentioned earlier, our next steps with this work is the convening of the graduation task force, which will take place on um, September 20th. The meeting will take place here at CERNA, and we extend the invitation here. We invite you to attend and participate in that. Um, we welcome your insights. And um, Russ, Ru Russell Rumberger, who was mentioned earlier, we're fortunate to have him attend and be uh, a presenter at that meeting. In addition, the recommendations that are made by that committee 
will then be used to serve, um, to inform LCAP priorities and budget investments for the 2017-18 school year. Just want to say that we are, we recognize one, that we can't do this work without the involvement of our community partners and want to thank those who've already um, agreed to participate in the task force. So we'll take um, public comment and then entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor and Mr. Harris. Any public comment? Um, we do have three public comments. First is Darlene Anderson, followed by Liz Guillen and Karen Sweat. Good evening, Darlene Anderson. I'd like to know, um, first of all, for the behavioral piece, when kids don't transition to task well, how many kids are ending up in the SARB or the Student Attention Review Board? How many parents are transferring their students from school to school site? Because I know some parents can transfer school sites maybe 10 times trying to get a place where their kids can be successful. I want to know how many kids are reading by the third grade? How many African-American students I would focus on? How many are actually reading by the third grade? What are the expectations of success? How many kids at the sixth grade are at grade level? Because that makes a difference. And what's happening in the seventh and eighth grade in the middle school years? Is that really effective in our district? Are we really you know, educating students in the seventh and eighth grade for the middle school? And I wanted to know, um, when we're looking at, I also know 100% of one is 100%. So it's still, the percentages just don't drive for me. I really want to know where our students are. And what happens when a student attends school for the four years of high school and then they get no credits, but they still attended school. And so what are we really doing when we're looking at public education? What are we looking at? I never, I, I, went, I went through this district, James Baldwin. I didn't even know who he was. I mean, you know, there are so many people that I don't even know who they are because I never learned about them. And it's just critical that we teach our kids how to think so that they can get a job. A lot of times kids leave this district, they're right over here on Stockton Boulevard and they're walking the streets with their heels. And so if we really wanna change, we really have to change, we really have to look at the data. And if we, not, if we don't have milestones that we measure, like third grade, sixth grade, seventh and eighth grade, ninth, at the end of the ninth grade, we're not looking at the data, we're not doing anything. So credits don't make a difference, what makes a difference is knowledge, and thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Superintendent, board members. I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. Full disclosure, I'm privileged to be appointed to um, the uh, graduation task force, and um, I consider it uh, a privilege, but also a lot of responsibility, which I take seriously. Um, I want to applaud, though, the uh, district's presentation tonight just in setting out some of the initial data that they're sharing. Um, I was a little concerned when I read the board memo, but I know how these memos go before board meetings. You just slap them together as fast as you can, try to be as concise as you can. But I have to tell you, I was very disappointed when I heard terms like uneven graduation uh, between student groups. Um, and even tonight, um, Dr. Uh, Taylor uh, used the term variation. Those, those are meaningful terms, um, but they mask the problem of the gaps. And that relates to equity. And I, I just think that it's important for us to be clear about that and for us to be brave about talking about using those terms. Um, I, I think the data is great. I recommend disaggregation by uh, boys and girls. Uh, and um, I have a question about um, the transferring out uh, element of the dropout uh, formula. Um, is it transferring out of the district or transferring out of a comprehensive high school in the district? I didn't see American Legion High School, and I can guarantee you there are students and families that are part of that school who think they're part of the district. 
um, and um, they want higher graduation rates. I think um, one of the things you should consider as those rates have decreased in the two-year period that LCFF was in full swing. This district got millions more because of LCFF. So there should be uh, some analysis of where the funds went and how it did or did not contribute uh, to the graduation rates that we're seeing. Uh, it speaks to the next item related to salaries. If one of our post-secondary options it, uh, for students that we offer are careers that pay half as well as what administrators in our district make, we can be very successful. We can pat ourselves on the back. Um, so it's just something to consider, and it's something that uh, we're always looking, looking at when we think about how we spend our resources. Um, thank you. Again, so excited to be on the task force and look forward to those uh, meetings. And um, just so that you know, I have alerted my network by email about this work. And I encourage everybody on the task force to do the same because I think it's such a lightning rod for all of us to come together. Our LCAP should address these issues. Priorities uh, seven and eight Ask speak to, please to wrap access. Up. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Liz. Karen Sweat. <laughs> Good evening, Karen Sweat, Making Sense Work. Welcome. Regardless of the budget. Did you all hear that a week ago when our new super, super, super superintendent uh, talked about his initiative? And I'm so curious as to what that means to all of you. We, MCW, hope that that means that the concept of students first finally might become a reality. We hope that the pervasive, unrelenting narrative of scarcity, loss, decrease, insolvency, deficit spending, that monopolizes budget conversations will come to an end and that the budget conversations are about spending resources in order to stem and reverse the dropout rate. To have the confidence to focus on spending, there needs to be an understanding of the fiscal health of the district. So how do we see the district as fiscally healthy? We start with looking at ending fund balance of all 14 funds. Are we down to 12? Take a look, you should have, at Fund 9, how the charter fund ending fund balance, the reserve, has grown. For example, this year there's an estimated $16 million in the charter fund, not the general fund, in LCFF base, SEP, and concentration. Perhaps there should be an effort to spend that money instead of putting it into the, letting it fall into the ending fund balance so that the reserve grows. So to your comments, regardless of the budget, we, MCW, would like to add, because of the budget, we know that you can afford to do what you want to do. And we're very excited. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me call on my board members then for comments and questions. Uh, Member Cochran. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And this is a question for Mr. Harris. Can you go back to the slide that shows the 80% graduation rate and the explanation of uh, who the students are and when they left? I found this uh, to be uh, very enlightening because uh, as simple as this is, I realized that I had some misconceptions about uh, who these students are or were and when they left. But I have a question for you. So if you start out with 100 students and 
you have the loss of 22 and uh, two enroll in another district and the 78 remaining, then you add two and you end up with 80. You have 100 students and you have 80 students going forward and you're saying that they all graduate. Is there a student who gets to be a senior and completes high school in the district but yet does not graduate? Uh, technically, there's definitions of what constitutes a graduate, so I would say that you know, you have to meet certain thresholds. So if you took five years, you don't meet the threshold. So I, I would say generally there shouldn't be a student who who meets the criteria to graduate and doesn't graduate because there, there's defined criteria as to why a student is considered a graduate. So out of the 100 that start uh, to reach the graduation rate, it's 80 students of these 100, this um, projected 100, 100 are actually graduating high school. Right. They would have met the credit requirement or taken the California proficiency exam or met the, the criteria as defined through adult school to be a graduate on time. Yes. Okay. And what are the uh, techniques you use to try to find out what happened to the 20 who you don't have uh, evidence or facts on? Great question, and, and you know, it, and certainly, I, I'm I'm not the content expert on all the strategies. I, I know that some districts, my, my old district, you, you do deploy uh, sometimes resources within the district, particularly those uh, social worker resources, sometimes parent family liaison workers to call families to to look for students. Not unlike what you sometimes do with attendance management mm -hmm. during this time of year uh, to try and solicit students, and so ultimately, a lot of it's phone calls. Uh, sometimes, depending on the strength of a particular nonprofit in the community, they may offer some support to the district to find those students. But I think there's a variety of strategies um, that are in place to, to try and, and find those students. But it's a very important question, and, and I, I think probably will be part of the work of the graduate graduation task force because it is a really important point. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Member Ryan. Thank you. I have a couple of questions and comments. Um, I want to begin by thanking Liz Gian, who I, I believe may have left, um, for her statements around language. I do believe that we need to be more intentional about calling out injustices and talking about opportunity gaps as just that. When we have an achieve achievement gap, we do students a disservice to talk about variances and unevenness. And so I do appreciate her willingness to bring that forward. I also want to welcome Mr. Harris to the team. I know that you bring with you a wealth of talent and experience, and I'm so grateful that you are going to be tackling this very meaningful and important work for Sacramento City Unified School District. Um, I think the presentation was excellent, and I have a couple questions. So first is on page uh, 15, actually PowerPoint item 15. So you note on this graph that we saw a decline in graduation rates for American Legion, frankly, unacceptable rates if you look at the continuation schools. So 29.3 and 29.1 respectively from the 2014 to 2015 cohort. But Capital City actually shows almost a 10% increase. So a 9% increase from 2014-15 to 2015-16. And I'm curious if you attribute that to anything in particular. So we don't have a, a full scale rationale for why that occurs. That would require further analysis of the data and, and the practices that occurred at Cap City during that time period. And so that has not occurred to date. Yeah. So I would hope that part of the work that Mr. Harris does and that the Graduation Task Force does is when you see almost a 10% gain um, for a school or population that is struggling, there is an analysis done of what perhaps was working that year that should be adopted moving forward. And so that's one question um, and comment. So, you know, also in the... Um, the memo that we had, there really was a thoughtful uh, trend analysis, which wasn't in the PowerPoint. And so I really just want to point this out once again, because I think this is so critical to the understanding of how much ground we have lost and for key underserved populations. So, you know, we have uh, really data that shows that we had a high 
in 2013 of 70% of our special education students graduating to a 2015-16 low of 56.6%. So staggering decline. So as we're looking at the 14 to 15 and 15 to 16 data, it's troubling when we're looking at the baseline from the state level, but it's absolutely astonishing when you see this downward spiral. If you look at our English language learners, 78.3% in 2012, 13 down to 15, 16, 73.3. For our African American students, we have a six point loss of 2012, 13, 76.2 to 2015, 16, 70%. And once again, and, and very troubling for our Hispanic students in Sacramento City Unified, we see a decline from a high of 83.1% in 12-13 to 77.5% in 15-16. I know that you're beginning to analyze the why and try to apply best practices to turn that around, but frankly, we should all be losing sleep at night from that decline and trying to figure out a path forward. And I'm so grateful that the graduation task force is an important important step in that direction. Um, on page 19, I had a question, and I think Liz began, uh, Liz Gian began to allude towards it. I have a question around this transferring out between the ninth and 12th grade. Does that also account for transfers within the district that are between our traditional public schools and our public charters? Right, so the transfer in and transfer out is totally a union of all Sacramento City schools. So it would be every every school within Sacramento City Unified. Okay. Uh, uh, district school or charter school. Okay. And you haven't done the analysis so that we're looking at, are we having students leave a traditional public, go to a charter, and then come back? And that will be kind of a probably a next step in this work you're doing. Okay, that's very helpful. And then finally, um, my comment around uh, page 22. So, you know, we have a, a very clear uh, detailing of what our high school graduation requirements are as opposed to the CSU, UC, A through G for your college readiness requirements. Everyone knows on the dais that I've been a huge proponent of A through G for all and frankly believe that our students should be opting out of that pathway versus lucky enough to opt in. And I will say once again, that's because the vast majority of parents believe that their students when they go to high school are being empowered with a course taking pattern that will allow them the maximum access to those four year opportunities. And it is heartbreaking when they find that that was not the case. And so when you couple that with this idea that there is a three year requirement for math versus our two year mathematics requirement and a body of research that shows that in the area of math, one of the greatest way to close the achievement gap between wealthy white students and underprivileged black or Hispanic students is math, we should be really reevaluating as a district whether or not we are comfortable continuing with a two-year baseline requirement if that is in fact just perpetuating this astonishing equity gap. So thank you so much for your work, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing what you bring forward with the Graduation Task Force. Member Pritchett. Thank you, President Hanson. And thank you, um, Vice President Ryan, for bringing up it. I won't repeat some of those questions because that was some of them that I had as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to future data, especially when it comes to the charters in our area and finding out who we're losing to those charters and what we're doing right and what we're not doing right. Um, I have a question regarding the 16, 17 year data and why we don't have it in our packet. I'm sure that that data is readily available and why aren't we comparing it in this graph? Great question. You know, we tie our, our graduation data to the California Department of Education database and because of CalPES, they actually do a reconciliation process and so it does actually take several months for them to certify the 16, 17 graduates. And so we would like to present you the data when it's totally clean, if you will, and they've done all the puts and takes, particularly from the transfer perspective, because with the California Department of Education, because of the CalPES number that each student has, they're able to reconcile students throughout the state. And so that gives us the most clear graduation number uh, versus recording something preliminarily. So when you say several months, what are, what are we talking? Uh, typically, they'll report it in uh, sometime between the window of, I'll say, April to May of the following year. So the certified number will probably be available in uh, sometime between April and May of 2018. 
after the graduation task force concludes. It's disappointing. I'm hoping that at least we can bring our information that we have on hand for Sac City to the graduation task force that we will compare, compare it. I think it's important for all of us to know where we stand the, the previous year because there could be great changes, um, good or bad, um, from, from year to year. Um, one of my questions is, uh, are you, do these, are these numbers reflective of who just graduated on time? And I think you kind of alluded that to a little bit, but I guess I'm trying to get to like, say there's a senior that needs to pass one class and then they end up doing summer school the, that following summer and then they graduate. So. This should capture a senior who completed summer school okay. to graduate, yes. Oh, you can ask that in your questions. <laughs> okay, I guess that that was um, my my only hope. I, I'm really happy that I've been chosen for the graduation task force. I've had um, children that have gone through this district. I've seen firsthand of some of the things that have happened. Um, so I'm really happy to put my input and my experiences that I've had um, towards it. And um, it's my, also my hope that the graduation task force also, that uh, all of the data is, is very important. But um, students that are involved in um, extracurricular activities that we're looking at that because I've seen um, students that uh, they're involved in these extracurricular activities and they've kind of supersede the classes that they should be taking to be able to graduate and or get into four-year university. So um, I'll be looking that, at that data as well. Hmm. Thank you. Member Minnick. So while we're talking about it, I'll, I'll continue um, Member Pritchett's question. So you mentioned that that these graduation rates would potentially include uh, those who have taken summer school class to, to catch up, um, assuming that that is considered part of their fourth year. Um, and so then is anything beyond that uh, would not fall into the category of graduate, well, if correct? If your senior would not. So any like any super seniors or whatever. Okay, so that's good. And so so I had a couple comments or questions. We'll leave this slide up because this is one of them. Um, and this goes to um, Member Ryan's um, thoughts about uh, our requirements of two year math. Um, and I think that oftentimes, not just in education, but in in anything, uh, when when goals aren't achieved, we lower the expectations. Um, and what's proven here, you know, specifically as I look at the Garden Grove uh, graduation rate compared to ours, uh, that having a higher expectation, uh, the students met, met the expectation, uh, which is a very different uh, idea than just kind of like lowering the bar. And so um, I appreciate uh, Member Ryan's thought, thoughts on, you know, seriously looking at uh, increasing those requirements of math, um, not only because it just is is better to prepare our students for the world, um, but also now there's proof there's proof that that districts have that third year and and are having uh, good results. And so, um, even though I know that's not the only factor, um, then the only other the other part I wanted to get to is back on slide 19, and I will keep going back to this: how graduation rates are calculated. Um, but my question, uh, is around, as is everyone's, um, sorry, uh, the, in this scenario, the 20, uh, students where we have no evidence of enrollment that have dropped, uh, essentially have dropped out. Um, the CalPADS data and the student number that, if I understand correctly, that's a consistent number. So if they change schools and, and anything, they're always going to have that same CalPADS number. Um, so in the scenario that you've created here, those 20 students, it absolutely would mean that they are not enrolled in a school in California, correct? Um, and is there, and forgive me if, it, if this was mentioned, but for students that have gone move to a school outside of California? Um, is there a consistency of identifiers for those students or would they fall into that, that 20 that we just don't know what happened? 20 
that we don't know right. anything about. So they could potentially be uh, have dropped out of school, but they could potentially have moved to another state and just picked up where they left off. And we just don't have access to that information. Okay. Thank you. Hey, member Wu. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Um, staying on the theme of the 20, uh, your hypothetical 20, where there's, uh, we're presuming that they dropped out. Uh, will part of the focus of the task force be to disaggregate that number 20 to find out, in fact, where they have gone, where they are, and uh, either take them out of the category of dropout because they don't quite fit that category or and or maybe provide some uh, uh, remedial uh, services or mitigation in order to get them back into school so they can graduate? You're nodding your head, so I'm. I mean, I'm in agreement with you. I think the the greatest challenge is to, to Board Member Cochran's uh, question is is finding them, but to the degree that we can find them, absolutely, they're a student uh, demographic that we need to understand. Uh, to the social justice issue at hand that you're getting at, uh, we definitely need to try and find them. I think for us, we'll look to the graduate task force to perhaps recommend strategies that we can use to find. Them. We can identify. Maybe we could. continue the pipeline, provide the services they need in order that they can meet graduation rather than just have them disappear off the face of the earth because ultimately they're going to be somewhere on this planet and they're going to be either uh, a consumer and or a, a deliverer of services and we'd like that they would be helpful in, in their community so rather than a drain. Thank you. You'll be responsible for wooing them back. <laughs> I can't take credit for that joke. But, uh, <laughs> but let, let me uh, let me also ask on the twenty. I assume uh, that we will, if we haven't already, that we will look at what other districts are doing to identify uh, dropouts. Because I also, it's hard to imagine that districts like that are achieving these 90% graduation rates don't have some kind of a strategy for looking at their dropouts so that they are reaching those high numbers. Um, maybe kids just aren't dropping out of those schools and their parents aren't as transient as our parents. I don't know. It's kind of hard to imagine there'd be a, a big discrepancy, but I uh, would certainly be interested to know how other districts do that. You know, one, obviously, if we can if the student truly is a dropout and they're still here in our area, we obviously want them back in our school. Uh, but also, if they've moved away, we'd certainly want to know. It would be interesting if we had, if there was a requirement to fill out a form when you're leaving school, and you know, if we could get people to do that. I know they couldn't be required to, but maybe it can be kind of like an exit interview type thing. At least we know a student's leaving. So I have to imagine there's some good ideas around uh, trying to tackle that number and make sure it's not unfairly tagging us. Um, I did like the um, suggestion of um, one of our public comments to disaggregate the information for our boys and girls. I think that would be valuable. I'd suspect that there's probably a difference between those um, the sexes. And I too appreciate this and I look forward to learning more. I think it's the first step for accountability. We have to know where we're at. So I uh, appreciate your work on this and look forward to more. Um, Member Bang. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Taylor and Mr. Harris, and welcome to Sac City Unified School District. Um, I just had a few comments and one question. Um, on slide 19, back to the 20 uh, students that we have no evidence for enrollment, uh, I'm curious, where do our students who are expelled from our school district, where do they fall in this, um, in this formula, or are they included at all? I believe they're expelled and don't graduate. They would just probably fall on into the, okay. drop off. Okay. Um, and then the other comment I had, um, Dr. Iris, uh, Dr. Taylor, I just want to say I really appreciate that um, you're going that the district is going to make a commitment to disaggregate the data on APIs, and I look forward to seeing that data on the twentieth. Um, I also just want to take this time to uh, thank 
my fellow board members in this school district for really just owning the fact that we do want to transform this district. And in order to do that, we really need to be able to be intentional and mindful that we don't create the kind of systems that we're trying to fight against. And so I think owning the fact that we recognize that there are inequities in the systems that we're working in is the first step in actually you know, making some kind of change. And so I actually just want to take this time to really just thank Superintendent Aguilar and our board for um, being courageous and calling out uh, the inequities in our system. Um, and then the second, what was the last? Um, I look forward to meeting uh, Russell as well. Um, and, um, and I'm excited that he'll be our next task force. And so the, uh, I'm looking forward to the meeting. I just do have a question. The task force meeting, they're open to the public, correct? Okay, so that's good. I just need to, to confirm that. So thank you. Wonderful. All right, uh, seeing no other comments. Thank you very much, appreciate it. And uh, we'll sure see you again. Uh, item 9.2, all up, Concy. Good evening, President Hansen, board members, and Superintendent Aguilar. We're here this evening to share with you, my name is Consi McCarn, Chief Human Resource Officer, and with me is um, Ted Appel, the Assistant Superintendent of Labor Relations, and Gerardo Castillo, Chief Business Officer. We're here this evening to share with you an agreement that has been reached between the district and the United Professional Educators, UPE. This tentative agreement reflects a common interest and commitment to the long-term goals and needs of students um, to ensure all students have an equal opportunity to graduate with the greatest number of post-secondary choices from the widest, the widest array of options. Just a point to say of the, the collaboration. The overall increase in salary and benefits the changes in the vacation structure and increased contributions to retiree benefits, along with other agreements in the contract will help ensure the district can, att can attract, retain highly qualified leaders, have resources to provide the essential programs and supports necessary to attain our goals, and help the district's long-term financial solvency. To share with you some of the highlights, Assistant Superintendent Ted Appel. Good evening. Uh, there was a recognition that in order to be competitive for all the uh, job positions in the bargaining unit, we needed to be a little creative and not just give a single raise across the board. Uh, therefore, we developed a new salary schedule that increases some salaries more significantly than others, but that provides an overall competitive salary schedule. Uh, UPE members will receive an average of 3.13% salary increase for 2016-17 school year. And after that, increases will be step and column related. That means no additional salary percentage increases for the 2017-18 and 2019 school years. With this agreement, UPE members will now be provided with family benefit coverage of 80%. Uh, this will significantly address the most glaring uh, deficit the district faced in attracting and retaining new administrators uh, to our district. Uh, also uh, intended to support attraction and retention efforts, additional longevity steps will now be available to members at years 13, 16, 19, 22, and 25. Uh, uh, obviously to uh, uh, when we train and invest in our administrators, and they invest in us, we want to make sure that we keep them uh, to re reap the benefits of their experience and longevity. Uh, retaining and recruiting uh, the right talent is key to achieving our guiding principle. Uh, this adjustment puts the district in a position to recruit and retain the strongest leaders for our, for our district. Uh, there were a number of items that UPE members worked on to help with issues facing the district. 
Uh, we appreciate that UP was willing to work with the district to reduce the district's long-term retirement liability by committing to making ongoing contributions to help ensure that retiree benefits can be provided. UP members will contribute $500 uh, toward retiree benefits phased in over three years um, to help with unfunded retiree benefit costs. Current UP members will reduce vacation days from 22 to five and extinguish unfunded vacation accumulation liability. Uh, they will either use those five days moving forward or will be cashed out at the end of the year. Future UP members will not receive uh, vacation days. <clears throat> UP is also agreeing to work collaboratively uh, in the development and implementation of a new administrator evaluation system. The creation of a meaningful tool and process will help, uh, help to support leaders uh, we need uh, to realize the district vision. And additionally, by agreeing to a three-year contract, administrators can now move forward focused on the important work uh, that needs to be done. Would like to thank the UP negotiation team for their work, time, energy, and effort toward making the mission of all students having an equal opportunity to graduate with the greatest number of post-secondary options from the widest array of options. And we feel that this moves in that direction to support that effort. The, dis the staff recommends approval. Do we have any public comments, Mr. Barrios? We do. We have two public comments. First is Judy Montgomery from UPE, followed by Liz Guillen of Public Advocates. President Hansen, board members, and Superintendent Aguilar, I'd like to introduce our negotiating team. We have Daniel McCord, Cindy Hollander, Kelly Dunkley, um, <laughs> Richard Owen, Garrett Kirkland, and missing was Cal Fawn. Um, I really don't need to say anything because Ted pretty much said everything. We had a common interest, and that was attract and retain. And it's been difficult, it's particularly difficult to get some of our teacher leaders to step into our administrative ranks when they find out that they have to pay for their dependent benefits. So this goes a long way to closing some of those equity issues between labor partners, and it really will help to get some of our teacher leaders to step into uh, UPE and site administration, district administrative offices. So we'd really like to thank the district's negotiating team. They were very patient. We worked almost a year on this very carefully. We have jobs. We're not off campus much, so we had to be creative with our meeting times. And um, I just can't thank you enough. And we really encourage you to um, ratify this or accept this offer on behalf. And then in the audience, UPE members. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello again. I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. Um, I'm not uh, going to um, urge support or opposition. Um, this is about what my comments are about uh, have to do with uh, the funding that's being used uh, for what appears to be a retroactive 3.13% increase. To the extent supplemental and concentration dollars are being used for that, um, that shouldn't be happening because I don't believe it was in the LCAP. Um, and to the extent it's going to be used going forward, um, there needs to be a justification as to how those funds are principally directed in a way that increases or improves services for low-income students, English learners, and foster youth.
There's one other piece. Hang on. The um, 16, 17 school year is over. So um, I hope that supplemental and concentration dollars aren't being used for that. Um, in terms of the evaluation system that was referred to in the agreement, I think that's great. Um, and I would encourage the district to involve parents and students in development of such a system to the extent possible. Every time we have recommended, uh, whether it's at the legislature or at a district level, that parents, students, and community stakeholders are involved, the unions just go wild. They just think that that's not possible. But there are ways that that can happen without infringing on the rights of union members. And I encourage you to do that because I think that the relationships that parents, students, and the community have with employees of the district have a huge impact on your ability to succeed in your goals, including graduation. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, well, first I'd like to read a statement on my behalf and then uh, we'll go to uh, board comments. So thank you very much for the presentation and the work. Uh, I wanna say why, you know, kind of put this into proper context of why we think it's important and what the agreement means for our district and our students. I um, want to thank the staff for all your work on this and negotiating this uh, with UPE and our principals. Uh, you obviously spent a long time. I wasn't aware it was a whole year. I knew it was a while, but uh, that's quite a, an effort on uh, all parties involved. And I believe that we have a win-win agreement here. Um, and I think it moves our district in the right direction and we appreciate it. And I think uh, it's fair to say that for the first time uh, in a while, we've got a, a very positive uh, relationship developing um, among a lot of our union partners. And uh, I credit our superintendent's vision uh, in joining our district. I think that's been a big help. Um, I think, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit later on tonight uh, how we're going to work to uh, move forward on that uh, plan. Um, and it's critical that the members of UPE are going to be uh, partners in this. You know, leadership starts at the top, and our principals and our other UPE members play a really critical leadership role. And they will in making sure that the board's vision and the superintendent's vision um, is successful in being able to be carried out at the schools. So you are valued partners. Um, and this agreement allows us to retain and recruit the best principals. We've known that that's been a problem for some time. Uh, we're excited that we're moving in that correct direction. Um, I also want to say that uh, the compensation package, because it's more competitive at all the levels, that we're not gonna lose people to other districts and we're in a better position to attract the strongest candidates to our district. And I like the uh, uh, comment also being able to recruit from within. If we have teachers or classified employees that would be interested in moving up the ranks into administration, we certainly don't want the package to be in a, in a position that prevents somebody who's a great candidate from being able to move within our district. I think those are some of the best hires we can have because they've obviously already proved uh, beneficial. So uh, the UPE leadership listened to our position, they understood our position, and uh, understood how important it was for us to remain financially viable and be able to provide the high quality education for our students. And we heard your concerns uh, through our negotiating team. And we got updates every two weeks at our closed session meetings. So we're pretty closely involved in understanding what's happening there. I think it was very important uh, that we reach this agreement in a fairly timely manner. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to the negotiating team and thank you to UPE leadership and your members. And we, I look forward to supporting this agreement. Let me call uh, Member Pritchett. Well said, President Hansen. First off, great job to the UPE negotiations team and staff. You guys have done a fabulous job, and I know that this was a long road uh, that, that you endured. Um, but I can't express 
how happy I am that we are finally here tonight doing what's right and recognizing the leaders at our sites. It goes without being said that without great leaders, our schools will not succeed. I wanted to thank all of our principals that stood up earlier for coming out and spending the night with us tonight. <laughs> um, I, my eyesight is not great these days, but I think I see almost every single one of my Area 3 principals in the audience, so fantastic job. <laughs> and I know that there's other board members that um, want to speak tonight, but I, um, you know, I, I just want to be the first to call to action and motion the approval for this contract. Thank you, Member Ryan. Thank you. Well, with that, I guess I will have to second uh, the approval of this contract. So I'd like to first thank our team and then UPE for the collaborative spirit with which you've entered these negotiations. I will share that I was absolutely flabbergasted when I joined the board almost three years ago and learned that the leaders of our school sites, our principals, were not receiving health care benefits for their families. It was astonishing to me and an injustice that I really felt like we needed to rectify. So this idea that we are able to offer competitive benefits so that we attract and retain our talented principals is huge. And I also just want to recognize the willingness of UPE members to also really work towards the fiscal health of the district by contributing $500 per year towards paying down the unfunded retiree benefits. I think that that is just another great show of leadership from already stellar individuals who do thankless work day in, day out to support our students and our families. So I'm very happy to support this proposal. Thank you, Member Wu. Thank you, President Hanson. I want to echo my colleagues' uh, statements. Um, thanking our team, thanking our UPE team, thanking you for your efforts and staying with us uh, really to um, make this a destination school district. This is an action item, so I'm going to move uh, approval of the, uh, of the agreement. I, I didn't hear it. That. Was it? No, we we have to do it. I heard a second. I didn't hear the first. <laughs> So just in case. Very good. But I wanted to um, share with uh, the audience uh, an item that wasn't mentioned in the presentation, and I really am thankful for this one. And that's the fact that UPA has agreed to cooperatively develop an administrative evaluation system. Uh, at the time when we have a new superintendent, this is extremely important because there's a lot of support in the community for the superintendent's vision. And this agreement helps the superintendent and UPE work together uh, on an evaluation system that will be consistent with the superintendent's vision. And also serve as an accountability tool to make sure our principals are held accountable to the standards that are set by our superintendent and working together to create that system of evaluation will work to everyone's benefit. So I thank you for that uh, um, uh, cooperating and agreeing to develop that because that wasn't mentioned in the presentation. So um, you moved it already? I second. And you second it? All right. I'll third it. We have any other board comments or any more seconds or firsts? Or, uh, <laughs> all right. I think we've heard enough. All right. Uh, we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Congratulations to all of us. Thank you very much. to our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? I have a second. second. We, have a fir we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. 
We are approved. So let us now go to the employee organization reports. CSEA, SCTA. President Fisher, welcome. Classes today, read better. Good evening, David Fisher, president of the Sacramento City Teachers Association. Welcome back to the beginning of the school year that we expect to be an extraordinary year for our district. While we're extremely concerned about the recent developments on the national level, particularly the recent mean-spirited attack on DREAMers, we are very proud to be part of a district that has been a leader in supporting the right of all students to receive a public education. We're especially encouraged by the leadership of Superintendent Aguilar in being a vocal advocate supporting DACA. We also appreciate the opportunity to work together on the task force to help improve graduation rates. We've got a lot of work to do, but you know, we're up to it. However, public education is under attack right here, even earlier in this building. Coming before this board very soon will be the next step in the local assault on public education. It's part of the Trump, DeVos, Michelle Re agenda to privatize public education through the proliferation of independent, unregulated, privately run charter schools. In the past, this board has had the opportunity to protect public education and protect the finances of the district, but abdicated its responsibility even when the charter petition was deficient and you had the tools to reject it. All eyes will be on this board to see how it acts to this vital issue over the next several months. It'll be difficult to achieve our goal of making Sac City the destination district if the board is willing to give away millions of dollars in ADA to independent, privately run charter schools who don't provide anything our district shouldn't be able to provide. Our district should be the incubator of innovation. and We are prepared to work together with new leadership of the district to accomplish this innovation. In fact, I've spoken here before about the diversity of educational opportunities already provided in this district, from Waldorf to dual immersion bilingual to innovative small high schools. In other words, there's no excuse for an outside private entity to come in and try to raid our district. Furthermore, it will be impossible to become a destination district if the district doesn't take steps to recruit and retain educators who reflect the diversity of our district. The recent TA with UPE, which we appreciate that you just um, accepted, makes it clear that the district seeks to be a destination district for administrators, even without a retention crisis among administrators. We understand that there are two, only two principal vacancies in the district. Both are filled with fully credentialed interim principals. The district appears to be willing to increase total compensation of UEP substantially by our back of the envelope calculation of about 18% over three years. With this settlement, combined with Philip Reese's Sacramento Bee article that came out last spring, Sac City is a destination district for administrators, which is a good thing. They work hard. They deserve it. But now it's time to take the next steps to make Sac City the destination district for students and educators. We look forward to working with the district next week when we will engage in bargaining every day, working to reach an agreement that accomplishes this goal. It's our hope that at the next board meeting, we will have an agreement with the district for your approval. Thank you. Thank you, President Fisher. SEIU. Welcome, Ian. Good evening, President Hansen. Uh, I always say supervisor, Superintendent Aguiar, board members. Um, first, let me echo uh, President Fisher's comments on the independent charter schools. Let's call them what they are. They're unregulated for-profit schools. They're here to make a buck. If they don't make a buck, they leave our kids high and dry. Um, so we need to make sure we take that into account. We start looking at these things. Um, secondly, welcome back. Uh, I think my, our folks are excited to be back at school. I want to uh, call out some of my folks, uh, your employees, classified employees, some of the lowest paid people in the school district, bus drivers, uh, many of whom gave up Labor Day to serve food to the homeless at Loaves and Fishes. So, um, you know, great. Love to see that kind of cooperation. Um, and we want to thank the school district for continuing to team up with us on our annual toilet paper drive. We actually doubled the amount of toilet paper we collected this year. Um, and 
uh, for the first time ever, the Cerna Center actually came in second. So but that was because our barrels got delivered late, so the, the transportation office was completely closed down during the time period the barrels were there. We will give you a chance. Uh, hopefully, you will continue to partner with us on our food drive, which will be in November and December, and we hope to see barrels here, and hopefully for the first time ever, the Cerna Center will actually fill up at least one barrel. Um, as far as the rest of the stuff, I just want to say um, we continue to bargain at the table with the school district. Uh, we've been negotiating for quite some time. Um, we're all getting along well at the table. We obviously disagree on a number of issues still, um, although we do have several tentative agreements that we think are beneficial both to our members and to the district. Obviously, we're still very far, to, far apart on economics, um, and strangely, we seem to be very far apart on a simple language issue on transfers, but um, I believe we're going to get there in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Teamsters, UPE. President Hansen, uh, distinguished members of the board, including my former student, <laughs> Superintendent Aguilar. My name is Richard Owen, and I'm the new executive director of UPE. As you can see, UPE is absolutely ecstatic with this new agreement uh, that we were able to negotiate that makes us competitive with the other 12 districts in the area in terms of total compensation. This indeed is part of making Sac City a destination district. As a bargaining partner, we also embrace what the other uh, labor partners have, have talked about. We embrace the notion of SCTA and their brochure talking about making this a destination district. Many of the things that are embedded in that document are things that we happen to agree with as well. We may be under-resourced, but maybe we can all join together and do what the city of Davis does every year and provide some other, ask our community to provide some additional resources so we can do the things we really need to do to accomplish what the superintendent and you have laid out in terms of our vision. UPE members also fully embrace and are ecstatic about the vision of this board and the superintendent with reference to the initiatives that you've set forth in terms of high school graduation. You've set that as a benchmark there. Now we can begin to work backwards on identifying those things along the pathway that will make that happen. I also want to point out that as you looked at that data, and I'm a community activist and I also host a radio show and do many other things as well. When you begin to look at those smarter balanced assessments, please be reminded that even though we're talking about graduation rates, for African American students, about 86% of them are below proficient in this district. Also for English language learners and Latino students. We've got to do something to bring up this issue about being proficient because it's not just graduating, it's what you know and what you're able to do. And I've heard Superintendent Aguilar address that. We also, as a, as a bargaining unit, also embrace the need to have uh, courageous conversations. We are not going to be able to solve these problems that you brought forth this evening without really having honest, robust conversations and out-of-the-box conversations that really will get us to this new place. I'm a longtime educator, 30 years. I've worked all over the country with the Gates Foundation, with the Stanford School Redesign Network. I recently served as a, as a retired annuitant and as a principal in your district at Pacific. And I've seen the inequities at that school in particular. We can't do this unless we get outside of the box. I've seen every assessment known to mankind, not just Common Core and all the, but through all the ones going back 30 years and the same results have been there for in our community. I also appreciate the fact that we're not going to be a part of, we're not going to be part of the blame game. We're going to be part of the solution with you. So UPE is going to step forward in this with you, and we're going to be dedicated and committed to coming up with solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we go to our district parent advisory committees, uh, CAC, the Community Advisory Committee. Someone representing the CAC. Darlene Anderson, come on yes, down. Darlene Anderson representing the CAC. It's been a, the other people have other business taken care of tonight, so I said I would do this announcement. 
the CAC is having a workshop for best practices, creating best practices and inclusive practices for students with disabilities. And it's a principal's forum. They would like to invite the principals. It's going to be on September the 19th. And it's going to be between 6.30 and 8.30. And all of the district's CAC workshops are on Tuesdays. And there's a whole list. The district, I mean, the CAC has a website with, a brochure that has all of what they're trying to accomplish and really just trying to build that partnership between parents of students with disabilities and the principal school's height principals. And so we would encourage you guys, some board members, to come and participate that night and check out the CAC's you know, website so you can know what's happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. District English Learner Advisory Committee. The LCAP Parent Advisory Committee. All right, we will go to our superintendent's report. Thank you, President Hansen, and good evening to everyone again. Um, I simply want to report out um, some observations. We had a very smooth opening of schools. Um, many of our principals have indicated that um, the opening of schools this year for them uh, was uh, one of the best years um, in recent um, memory. Um, as I traveled around on the first day of school after dropping off my own children um, at their new school sites um, and stopping by very quickly at a number of sites, they all seemed uh, to be going very smoothly. Students were excited and nervous and anxious, and so were parents. And both parents and students were crying at some places, uh, but all in all, um, very inspiring. Um, certainly want to thank all of our employees, uh, certificated and classified, uh, for all of the countless hours uh, here at CERNA and at every one of our school sites, our custodial staff, our clerical staff, uh, just everyone that was involved in putting in countless hours to ensure that our schools opened um, in the conditions that they did uh, with smiling faces, welcoming um, all of our students back uh, to uh, the 2017-2018 school year. Uh, many of you know that uh, we opened on the first day of school uh, with a press conference at Hiram Johnson High School, um, focused on a very serious topic that we've heard throughout today's board meeting, which is uh, trying to address um, our current graduation rates. Uh, many uh, community members uh, were there to join us. Um, we appointed 21 uh, uh, appointees to the graduation task force, and most of the task force members were there as well to join us. And I just want to appreciate and say thank you to the uh, number of individuals that were there at Hiram Johnson uh, during the day. Um, we obviously think that in order to change uh, current outcomes throughout the system, we have to take very seriously the idea of looking at the systems that are producing the outcomes from an equity, access, and social justice lens, uh, that that work not become a standalone effort, not just applied to the graduation task force, but rather that it become the backbone of our entire organization. And I look forward to um, starting those conversations with our graduation task force members um, at their first meeting, which um, I'd like to invite everyone to. Um, it's taking place here at the CERNA Center on Wednesday, September 20th um, at 5.30 with a starting time at 6 p of 6 p.m. Uh, sharply. Um, Obviously, um, when I do talk about this topic, I've, I've said time and time again that we have a moral responsibility uh, to change outcomes such as graduation rates, but I'm also very focused um, uh, soon after at looking at other outcomes that we have to change, uh, reading by third grade, making sure that our students are leaving elementary schools ready and prepared for the rigorous instruction of our middle schools, that our middle school students are ready for the rigorous instruction before they reach high school. And um, as we increase graduation rates and A to G completion rates that our students departing our high school, um, our high schools throughout the district are prepared for the rigorous instruction of um, post-secondary education 
uh, regardless of what that choice might be. Um, finally, um, I want to just reiterate um, that we are working very closely with um, a coalition of partners, uh, labor partners included, um, on how the district will continue to be a leader around um, what it means to be a safe haven school district, uh, not just for our students, but for our employees as well. Um, it's what inspired me um, in great part to become superintendent here in Sac City. And so you'll continue to hear about some of the initiatives that we uh, are, 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 are assessing um, at the moment and will continue to assess with a number of partners uh, over the next few days. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to you, uh, President Hansen. Thank you very much. So let me take a few minutes just for my president's report. First, I guess I want to sadly kind of start off on a sad note. Um, I had several SCTA teachers who shared a recent email from their union that was really quite derogatory and bullying to me. It was quite a surprise. Um, it addressed the issue that you had mentioned a little earlier. I thought that you know, it was, uh, it was really a very poor way to motivate your members as they start the new year. It was uh, quite a surprise. And, you know, we wouldn't tolerate bullying in the classroom and schools, and we shouldn't tolerate it here either. You know, when I grew up as a closeted gay child, I experienced bullying. I know what it was. I know what it's all about. And the teachers were the ones who supported me and offered some protection. So the SCTA email was a real surprise to me. Uh, I thought it was mean-spirited, and the goal seems to be to make teachers try to hate somebody. I just don't really understand that and see how that's beneficial to your agenda whatsoever. So on behalf of the teachers who kindly reached out to me and apologized for the bullying and derogatory comments, thank you, and uh, I accept that. So let me talk about a little bit of good news. I went to the McClatchy High School recently, and we're about to finish an amazing project that I wanted to share the pictures because it's something that I think we can do at more of our schools. This is going to be the new soccer and track field. So thank you to our facility staff. We've got some amazing, amazing work that's happening with our facilities, and I think it's a, an amazing uh, way to start. I'll show you how can, we can share, we can do some of these at other places. Um, I think it's just a really great motivation for our students and our staff and shows what we can do when we make the investments in our community. So that, I think, is very exciting. Um, secondly, the uh, opening day, uh, press conference that we did last week was really inspiring to me. It was a very good event, well attended, and I think that's the kind of uh, things that we should be doing on opening day, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, that the superintendent of putting together the graduation task force, I think, think that's something that will be very positive for our community and definitely move us in the right direction. And you know, let me close with talking about some real bullying, and that's what's happening at the federal level. The recent statements and the decision by our federal government to rescind DACA is a travesty. It's mean-spirited, it's cruel, it's unnecessary, and it's the kind of thing that we should absolutely and we will absolutely stand against here in this district. So I really appreciate the support um, that all the board members and the superintendent uh, have all come together on that. Uh, and, you know, we all are going to be strong allies on this moving forward. Um, I know that we have many students and staff uh, that are DACA uh, folks, and they've got our full support, and they're valuable parts of our community, and we value them and look forward to having them be part of our community for as long as they would like to stay here. So with that, let me... I'll turn it over to our student member, Nguyen, for your comments. Um, so school started. So the Student Advisory Council, we've been working on um, finishing the conference planning. 
It's going to happen either October 18th or the 25th. And we're just finalizing our presenters working through the workshops. And our first Youth Congress meeting with students from across the district is September 20th from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Thank you very much. And now it's time if any board members have comments. We Member Pritchett. Thank you, President Hanson. Um, first, um, I just want to announce, I know I've mentioned before that the Parent Teacher Home Visit um, Project will have their annual conference October 26th to the 28th here in Sacramento. Um, today, I don't know if you've received in your board packet, but there was also a letter and an envelope in, um, our, um, in, in our board envelopes here. Um, you know, I, I want to challenge our board. This, um, you know, knowing that the parent-teacher home visit, I keep on saying project, the parent-teacher home visits um, originated here in Sacramento and the conference is also here in Sacramento. So um, I would really like to just challenge each of us and uh, registration right now. There's an early bird special until the 22nd of September and the cost is $345 to attend. So I would like to ask each of our board members that we sponsor a teacher from each of our areas um, to attend this. After the 22nd, that price goes up to $395. So um, let's try to get that all taken care of and we can save ourselves a, a little bit of money. Also, um, during the conference on Friday the 27th, there's going to be a special gala in recognition of Miss Carrie Rose. Miss um, Carrie Rose had um, really put her blood, sweat, and tears into the organization to make it what it is today. So I hope that you'll all join me at that gala. Um, let's see. I... Uh, also attended, along with other board members, the um, Sacramento County Board of Education Teacher of the Year Banquet. And um, as we know, Miss Elizabeth Henrikson of Sutter Middle School and Miss Rebecca Siegert of R H um, Ro I almost said R H S Rosemont High School um, were our, our Teachers of the Year that were moved on to the and were um, noticed and um, at the SCOE banquet. Um, I'm very excited to say that Miss Rebecca Siegert was one of two teachers that were chosen um, of all the many that um, will now move on um, and compete for Teacher of the Year at the state level. So um, this was a very exciting night, and I'm very proud of her. Um, regarding DACA, we all, this is a, this is a very sensitive subject, and um, I'm too disappointed with the president's decision this week to end DACA. As a parent, my heart hurts for the students and families that are being targeted by this decision. I just want to say that regardless of how targeted that you are all feeling right now, here in Sac City, you are part of our community and part of our family. We will continue to support our DACA students, parents, and staff. I feel fortunate that my colleagues on the board and our superintendent are already looking for ways to advocate for solutions. I would like to ask our parents and the larger community to join us in these efforts so we continue to live up for our safe haven promise of being the district that welcomes all students and employees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Wu. Thank you, President Hansen. Um, First, I wanted to um, share with you, everyone, that on this past Tuesday, I had the opportunity to um, participate or listen on a lecture on childhood ADHD. It was very illuminating. It was uh, conducted uh, at the Mind Institute. There were about three dozen people there, mostly parents, uh, interested in um, uh, what they can do for their children. Uh, I have a better appreciation for the difference between a uh, a 504 accommodation and a IEP now as well. And um, let me just, uh, one thing that I carried away from there is that if you have a child who is uh, on the spectrum, uh, even sl uh, more than slightly ADHD today, be very, very careful as they come out of adolescence and they prepare to graduate from high school and go away to college. Because if you're taking... Um, uh, medication like Ritalin, uh, which helps the child focus, and they started experimenting with marijuana, 
which helps diffuse the mind, their brains go really screwy. So parents have to be vigilant and um, uh, really educate their child as they're uh, watching out for them as they grow up. Now, I, too, have a statement regarding uh, DACA, and it's prepared, so I'm going to share it with you all. This week was a dark and terrible week for those dreamers in our schools afforded protections under DACA, the Deferred Action for Children Act, put into place by then-President Barack Obama. This week's announcement to end DACA is a cruel and, in its core, unnecessary political immoral act. Paraphrasing President Obama, he said, and I believe, that dreamers are Americans in their hearts, in the minds, in every single way but one, on paper. This is about whether we are a people who kick hopeful strivers out of America or whether we treat them the way we'd want our own kids to be treated. It's about who we are as a people and who we want to be. What makes us Americans is not a question of what we look like or where our names come from or the way we pray. What makes us Americans is our fidelity to a set of ideals that all of us are created equal and that all of us deserve the chance to make our lives what we will, that all of us share an obligation to stand up, speak out, and secure our most cherished values for the next generation. That's how America has traveled this far. That's how, if we keep at it, we will ultimately reach that more perfect union. Thank you, President Obama. Sacramento City Unified School District became the first SIF safe haven district in the state of California. I also believe this pro pro proclamation of safe haven is the most comprehensive anywhere and has been held up by State Superintendent Tom Torlakson as the exemplar for California public schools. Our superintendent and our labor partners are working hard to make sure that this declaration has teeth, has meaning. Dreamers, know that our words are not idle. The sign safe haven behind me is not just a sign which says all are welcome. We are putting action behind those words. I commit and I believe that my colleagues would join me in doing everything within our power to make sure that you will be protected. Only then can we say that we are moving towards a more perfect union. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Minnick. That's a tough one to follow. Um, so I have a couple things. First, I have an um, announcement for anybody that's interested. Uh, there is going to be a movie night going on at um, um, tomorrow night at uh, Artivio Guerrero Park, which is uh, just a couple blocks from Peter Burnett Elementary School. It's on 61st Street, uh, just south of Fruit Ridge. Uh, tomorrow night at sundown. So if you want to come see Finding Dory um, with, uh, come hang out with me and our council member, Eric Guerra, it's going to be fun. Um, I think we, uh, folks can uh, come starting around 6.30 and sundown's probably 7.30, 7.45 now. Um, and so that should be a uh, fun evening tomorrow night, Friday. Um, the other thing is I, I too, want to respond to the DACA repeal um, as frustrated as I am that we spend so much time having to play defense against the federal government. Um, sometimes we, we just have to. Um, you know, our first priority is to ensure that students in our community are getting the education they need and the education they deserve. This means providing support to all students and their families, no matter their immigration status. Despite the painful words and even more painful actions at the federal level, um, know that we're here to support all of you and to make sure our community continues to benefit from your presence and participation in our uh, educational system. So, you know, we're all glad you're here and we want to make sure that you are here to stay. Thank you, Board Member Minnick. Board Member Cochran. Thank you. I, too, would like to congratulate the Teachers of the Year. Uh, I'm very happy to say that in Area 2, 
I have the connection to both of them. One of them, uh, Miss Elizabeth Hendrickson, is a wonderful teacher at Sutter Middle School, and she was awarded uh, Sacramento City Unified uh, Teacher of the Year and well-deserved for teaching English in a very inspirational way. The other, uh, Miss Rebecca Seeger McGill, is the wife of the principal at Phoebe Hurst. And so it's um, very happy, it was very happy to learn that the connection was there for both of them into area two. So I too have a uh, statement that I'd like to read about DACA. I too want to express my disappointment in the president's decision to end DACA this week. As a teacher, my heart hurts for these students, many of whom I know for a fact are former students of mine. This news has casted a shadow of pain throughout the nation for students as well as educators. To my fellow teachers who are on the front lines having to deal with reactions from their students, who are feeling the burden of this decision on their lives, I want to say, stay strong for your students. They are looking to you as a source of strength and inspiration to weather the storm in their lives. Our district stands firm with our students. Our district stands firm with our teachers. And if you'll indulge me, quisiera leer en español también, perdona, por favor, mi acento. Soy una maestra jubilada y en este tiempo mi corazón arde para estos estudiantes afectados. Yo sé que muchos de ellos eran mis estudiantes. Esta noticia ha brindado mucho daño en todo el país para, para estos estudiantes y también para maestros como yo. Tengo un mensaje para todos los maestros. Por favor, manténganse fuertes. Tus estudiantes están contando en ti para ser una fuente de inspiración en este tiempo, tiempo difícil. Nuestro distrito apoyará a nuestros estudiantes. Nuestro distrito apoyará a nuestros maestros. Gracias. Thank you very much. Member Vang. Uh, first, I just want to take this time to welcome welcome all our students and parents back to school. Uh, I'm excited to officially start my first full year as a board member um, uh, on Sac City Unified School District. Um, last Thursday, I was able uh, to visit eight sites of my 14 schools in Area 5. Um, and I look forward to many more site visits and meetings with teachers and parents to come. Um, I also would like to make a comment regarding um, the news earlier this week regarding DACA. Um, as a daughter of Hmong refugee parents, I know what it feels like when you're not welcome to feel under attack. And like many of our undocumented students and families, my parents also came here fleeing an unsafe environment in need of opportunities that was not available in their homeland. And yet, even when my parents did arrive, more than two-thirds of Americans didn't want them here. Um, but nevertheless, my parents and my community persisted. So all the DACA um, students, our dreamers, our teachers and employees, I want you to know that I and our board will continue to fight for your safety, uh, for a place for you to belong, for opportunities to achieve your dreams, our superintendent, our board, and our labor partners are working hard to find solutions to protect our dreamers. Um, and please know that Sac City is your home and that you belong. Thank you very much. Member Ryan. Thank you, President Hansen. Um, the beginning of the school year is supposed to be a time of joy and hope and aspiration, a time when children and educators feel really energized by a sense of endless opportunity and possibilities. It is not meant to be a time characterized by heartless action and senseless tragedy. Unfortunately, I have to speak to both those things tonight, both at a national and local level. First, I wanna share a brief statement that encapsulates my feelings around the senseless actions taken on our DACA um, DACA students and um, people across the country who have contributed so much to society. Dreamers, I am ashamed. I'm ashamed that you live in a country where our president could have so little regard for your pain or contributions to society. 
ashamed that you will be forced into the trauma of not knowing what the road before you holds, ashamed that somehow you are being told that you are less than my children, less than native-born children, the native board college students, and less than others in the workforce. Please know that you are loved. Know that you are valued. Know that you are welcome here and that we will do everything in our power to right this injustice. And our Safe Haven School District effort is just one example of that. Unfortunately, tonight I also have to speak to a tragedy that's happened in my community um, last Friday, two of our elementary school students and their mother were violently attacked in their home. This has been an unfathomable tragedy on many levels. Many of you have seen the news that has been widely reported over the past weekend, and I have been comforted by the tremendous spirit and resilience of district staff and of the Oak Ridge Elementary School community that have stepped up in remarkable ways to comfort this family. I have been joined over the weekend and throughout the week by Superintendent Aguilar, by Principal Danny Rolleri, and Oak Ridge staff to sit with family in the hospital as they sent their thoughts and prayers to the two small children who were victimized. Unfortunately, I have the very sad um, news to report that today we lost our young eight-year-old, uh, and tonight we are going to be adjourning in his memory. There is really nothing that I can say in this time. It is absolutely beyond words and hurts at the core. It is hard enough to lose people to violence such as gun shootings and gang violence that we have seen consistently in my community throughout the last summer. But to have an eight-year-old pass with his entire future in front of him feels tragic to no end. So I want to thank the superintendent, I want to thank the staff, and I want to thank the families and community members who have offered endless support through this very difficult time. We will continue to need you moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We will move to our board committee reports. Uh, facilities committee is up first. Uh, the only report I have is that with our next facilities meeting will be held September 18th at uh, noon at the um, First Avenue facilities office um, and uh, the agenda will be posted on the website. Good, thank you. Um, budget committee. The budget committee met on August 22nd uh, here in the Indiana room, I believe, and we will be meeting again on September 28th in the Indiana room at five, five o'clock. Very good, thank you. Academic committee. Thank you. We um, the academic committee met this week, um, where we're uh, we've been looking at uh, we're starting to look at the the CDE the, the Department of Education's uh, data dashboard and and how um, how the information there coincides with our work on uh, graduation rates that's uh, coming up as, as kind of a precursor um, and how it aligns as we talk about uh, grading policies and, and all kinds of other things uh, and how it interrelates with uh, academics. Uh, our next meeting will be on October 3rd at 1.30, also in the Indiana room, just behind the, um, the cafeteria. Thanks. Thank you very much and the Board Governance and Policy Committee. Thank you. Um, the Board Governance and Policy Committee last met on uh, August 25th to discuss policy updates around accessibility of district websites and updates to other policies related to public records requests. The committee also discussed their desire to look for a professional facilitator for future board retreats in order to help foster 
a board collaborative that is pushed towards a more ambitious and effective working condition moving forward. In addition, in the interest of our Safe Haven School District work, we are reviewing our board policies to ensure that they reflect the intention of Safe Haven School District. The next meeting of the Governance and Policy Committee will be at the Cerna Center on September 22nd from the first uh, from 1 to 3 p.m. Good, thank you. Um, I think we are just announcing our future board meetings September 21st and October 5th. And I will entertain a motion from student member Nguyen to adjourn. So moved. Do I hear a second? And a second. All in favor? Opposed? Oh, and uh, yes, I'm sorry. We have a, we will adjourn. Let me turn it over to Jesse. You want to make the recognition? So tonight we're going to adjourn in the memory of Dante Daniel. Good. Um, I'll entertain the motion in a second. Second. Again. Moved. second. Good. Thank you all in favor. Aye. Opposed. Abstain. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. <laughs>